there's something in these woods. Something people refer to as a swamp ape, skunk ape, even Bigfoot. It's a large, bipedal, hairy creature that many people in the South report having seen. Now one of the current theories for Bigfoot in America is that Gigantopithecus black eye, or possibly the Yeti, followed man across the Bering Straits and ended up in America. Now this theory is as good as any other theory. However, we're going to explore it as well as other theories of how apes could have ended up in America. Hi, I'm Jay Michael and your host for this program, Swamp Apes. For years, stories have circulated in the South about hoodoos, haints, and wild men. Only recently has the term Bigfoot been applied to what people say they've seen in the southern forests. Could an unknown species of primate be living and thriving in the hot, humid woodlands of the southern United States? And if so, where did it come from? The purpose of this program is to explore one possible explanation for the sightings reported along the southern states. We will discuss the theory and see if it fits some, if not all, of the facts and stories reported. It will be up to you to decide if you believe the context of this program. People from all walks of life have reported something unusual in the forests south of the Mason-Dixon line. Swamp apes, a Bigfoot-type creature said to inhabit woodlands from Oklahoma to the Everglades of Florida. If we assume that these people are not hoaxing or lying about their encounters, and the evidence suggests this, then we are pressed to explain the strange sightings reported monthly to various Bigfoot agencies. For all accounts, the phenomenon appears to be real, and in most, if not all, cases, the animal is described as ape-like or primate in nature. If so, then where did this animal come from? It's the contention of this program that the possibility that we humans brought them here is a valid theory. Throughout antiquity, white men have placed their steps on American soil. Some of these adventurers became historical figures, some not. But we know that men other than the indigenous natives of America have visited this continent. The Vikings arrived long before Columbus, so did the Chinese and perhaps Phoenicians. The French and Spanish colonized the South long before the English took over, and pirates who sailed the seas in search of exotic booty used the Mississippi for convenient hiding places, often running their ships aground and losing their precious cargo. It's possible that any of the aforementioned travelers could have brought primates into this country, perhaps by design or by accident. Any nation with sailing ships and the ability to transport animals could be responsible for the now feral primate population in the southern United States. The Louisiana Neutra is an example of an animal brought here from another country. Various plants, birds, insects, and mammals now inhabit the coastal United States that originated from distant lands. Pirates were notorious for dealing in anything exotic. Animals were no exception. Even the atypical image of a pirate is a scruffy bearded man with a parrot on his shoulder, an animal native to Africa. Certainly, a baby ape, which looks almost human, would be considered exotic. And since the population of America at that time was mostly uneducated, passing an ape off as a wild man or monster could be easy. Unfortunately, apes grow up, and as they get bigger, they get louder, nasty, and uncontrollable. Very good reasons to offload your exotic prize at the nearest port. If apes were brought to America, perhaps to sell or display, and were let loose in the wild, 
they would certainly be something unusual if encountered by the people living here. The natives would have no idea what an ape is, and most of the settlers would not know either. Stories would abound and get changed over the years, and if apes were brought here from various different family groups in Africa over a period of years and set free, they would find each other in the wild, mate, and produce more apes. Pirates are not the only possible origin of apes in America. Predating the Vikings, the Phoenicians had skills and capacities that far surpassed anything done in the same fields in Europe during the Middle Ages. The Egyptians and their neighbors in Mesopotamia and Phoenicia knew more about astronomy, the key to ocean navigation, than any Europeans contemporary with Columbus, Cortez, and Pizarro. And the Phoenicians, in collaboration with the Egyptians, were circumnavigating Africa at the time of the Pharaoh Nietzsche, 2,000 years before Columbus set sail. We marvel at the abilities of the ancients, their pyramids and obelisks, sophisticated mathematics and calendar systems, and a perfect mastery of maritime architecture, as evidenced by the functional form and complex rigging of their ships of planks and reeds 5,000 years ago, and their skill in exploration and colonization dating back 3,000 years. But is it realistic to stand in awe of such achievements, only to deny these ancients the ability to do what Pizarro did with a handful of men in a subsequent age? No matter how apes got here, apparently they are here. So the question becomes, could they survive here? If apes were brought here, could they survive? The answer is yes. In fact, the primate institutes in Louisiana today were founded there for that very reason. Our southern climate is perfect for apes, according to Tulane University's Regional Primate Center in Covington, Louisiana. Southern winters are mild, and there is abundant food sources in the forest to survive on. However, an ape now living in the south would have to adapt to its new environment, something primates are well suited for. Unlike the jungles of Africa, fruits do not grow in abundance in the south and are usually seasonal. Apes used to climbing trees and using vines to reach food would find the pine forests here something of a challenge. There is no food in the trees and using the trees for navigation would be useless. Therefore, the first thing the ape will adapt to is finding food on the ground. And this is a crucial change that will affect the behavior of the primate. Apes are omnivores. They eat meat, fruits, and vegetables. Primatologists agree they will eat just about anything. However, our southern primate will find that meat is now the easiest and most convenient food source available. Rats, mice, Snails, snakes, turtles, possum, weasels, frogs, even deer would be its staple diet. We now know that one of the contributing factors to our human evolution was when we came down out of the jungles and began migrating across the prairies of Africa. As we became accustomed to life on the ground, we too ate more meat, and this factor alone is why we gained the intelligence we now have. Meat built stronger muscles, the brain grows larger, and we got bigger. This was an immediate adaptation with quick results. The more we subsided primarily on meat, the smarter we got. The same would happen to our southern swamp ape. It doesn't take years of evolution for this to happen. It can happen in a few generations. The second adaptation our primate would discover is the usefulness of transitioning from quadruped to biped. The animal would learn to walk upright. Why? Since the advantage of spotting predators from the thick jungle canopy is no longer available to the primate, seeing over the bushes and brambles of a southern forest would be an advantage. Plus, reaching up to pick the few seasonal fruits from the thin limbs of a tree is far better than trying to climb out on a limb and falling 
because the branches won't support your weight. The animal would learn that life on the ground means walking tall to see if you are being stalked and using your appendages to reach and grab. This is not without precedent. Oliver, the famous chip that walked like a man, learned how on his own. When placed in an environment where standing erect is necessary and useful, primates have been recorded to do so, and will adopt the biped stance over crawling as a permanent way to navigate. If only one or two primates were brought into this country by man in years past, then they certainly would have died. There simply would not have been enough of them to mate with and survive. However, if they were brought periodically over a period of years and deposited annually, then a viable genetic population could have taken hold. By viable, we mean that some could have survived to this day. A huge population would require a large genetic grouping to have been left here, but we don't have a huge population of swamp apes. If we did, they would be seen far more frequently. What we appear to have is small groupings in various southern states, scattered in possible family units. Exactly what you would expect to find if the animals were brought here randomly from different family units in their homeland and left here to find each other. If primates began arriving here as far back as the 1500s, then there would be five centuries for their numbers to grow. Even if there were only a few happenstance occurrences of primate abandonment, it is possible that primates would survive and find suitable mates to continue to survive to this day. There would of course be occasions where unsuitable mating would occur, and this is supported within the research being conducted today in the South. Many cases of Bigfoot or swamp ape sightings include finding unusual footprints, Prints that display three, four, and five toes are common. Whenever a population of animals begin mating within family units, the digits, fingers and toes, will be the first noticeable display of inbreeding. And since we can assume no new primates have been abandoned in the past century due to laws enacted to protect the import of non-indigenous species, then this would be the tragic results of its impact the few remaining primates in the wild. We may be looking at a new adaptive species of primate that is becoming extinct. This also explains why there are no fossil records of Bigfoot found in the American South. They simply were not here yet. Whenever two animals meet in the woods, they have to make physical contact to have a conflict. If a bear and cougar are to fight for territory, they must come into contact to do so. However, man is the one animal in the forest that does not have to make physical contact with an animal to pose a threat to it. Man carries weapons. A man can stand yards away, point a weapon, and kill an animal in short order. Simple observation on the part of the primate would teach it that man is the one animal he needs to avoid. If a man points anything like a stick or box at the primate, it could have seconds to live. So the primate would learn to avoid man at all costs. This would also explain why no clear photographs of Bigfoot exists. Man is the one and only animal in the forest that poses any real threat to the primate. Subsequently, the primate might avoid any object he believes man has placed in the woods, as that object may be controlled from a distance as well. So game cameras, traps and such would be useless. The ape's instinct would be to flee if man is near. However, primates are curious. So observation would be key to survival, and a primate would learn quickly that man needs to see their prey in order to kill it. Therefore, elusive techniques would be adapted. Stealth would be paramount. The ape would quickly learn that bold actions may get him killed. 
If a man is walking in the woods, still objects will go unnoticed, but movement will be picked up readily. The primate would need only to learn to stand still or drop to a quadruped stance and wait for the man to walk by. Then the primate can exit in relative safety. Again, these abilities would be simple learned responses for a primate now eating meat and becoming more clever and intelligent. The ape would be like a sniper. He does not want to be seen, and he can navigate the terrain far better than man. His ability to seemingly disappear in the woods would be a learned technique over years of observation. Swamp apes would not be on the verge of discovering fire or ready to invent the wheel. That would take centuries of adaptation and evolution. But simple skills to avoid danger would be the first signs of a growing intelligence. And according to reports, this is just the type of behavior observed when rare swamp ape encounters happen. Of course, no animal is perfect, so occasionally swamp apes are seen and reported. And in almost all cases, it's only a fleeting glimpse as the animal leaves the area in short order if it knows it's been seen. One aspect of Bigfoot research is vocalizations. Various howls, screams, calls, and whistles have been recorded in the forests all over the United States, including the South. Many of these calls have been identified as primate-like, though to date no one has clear evidence the sounds came from primates. If primates do use vocalizations, then the sounds would be a way of communicating and locating each other. In years past, towns and cities were spread far apart, and wooded areas between them could easily be used to move about the South unseen. Even today, there is sufficient wooded areas in the South whereby a primate could move about and not be noticed. There have also been reports of wood knocking, the wrapping of sticks against trees. This suggests a rudimentary use of tools and may be an indication of their growing intelligence. In years past, moving from one state to another, even several states apart, would not have been difficult. The idea of the swamp ape being completely different or exactly the same as the Pacific Northwest Sasquatch is as varied as the people who study them. Until a body is available to examine, we cannot answer this question with any certainty. However, the aforementioned adaptation theory may lend a clue. If Bigfoot is a displaced ape, then it would have likely adapted to whatever environment it settled in. This would depend on where the primates were abandoned and how far they traveled. Apes that moved into the Pacific Northwest would adapt to the rocky wilderness there and primates that gravitated to the south would adapt to our swampy forests. Therefore, they would be the same apes, but with different behaviors. And since we appear to have creatures scattered across America, we can assume they traveled far and spread out across the continent, changing and adapting along the way. As civilization moved in and began dividing the country up, replacing forests with towns, highways, and other obstacles, the primates would be forced to remain where they are now, unable to cross the country as easily as they may have done in centuries past. This would lead to dwindling populations and additional inbreeding. Isolated and restricted to the remaining parcels of suitable forest lands available to them, the creatures would begin to die out. Without a clear idea of a total population, we cannot make an estimate on how long they would survive. However, as their habitat decreases, sightings would increase as the animal is now forced to cross populated areas, and an increase in such sightings is happening today.
Entering the Bigfoot field or community is usually by one of three ways. A person has a sighting and is seeking more information on their encounter. A person influenced by the media is seeking information. Or a person has had a lifelong curiosity about the subject. All researchers in the field are amateurs. Cryptozoology, the study of unknown or uncatalogued animals, is not an accepted science. The scientific community is not investigating Bigfoot to any noticeable degree. Therefore, only a few dedicated amateurs are leading the quest for more knowledge on the subject. And only a few scientists have devoted time and research to the phenomenon. Sightings are reported monthly and posted on websites for other researchers to read and study. Investigators will call or travel to locations of sightings when they come in. However, not all sightings can be thoroughly investigated as there are only a few people capable of conducting a proper study. Hoaxes abound and lead to false reports and fantastic claims in the media, making it more difficult to study the real phenomenon. In fact, media disinformation and outright fabrications have tainted the public's attitude towards the subject, leaving the mystery even more likely to continue without a conclusion. Within the many reports received yearly, most are from credible people with impeccable character. Evidence is not always found, but eyewitness testimony usually leads to the discovery of more people in the same area that also had encounters but were too afraid to talk about it, fearing ridicule. Most hoaxers are discovered readily, and their false claims are dispelled. However, their impact on the community leads to setbacks in the quest. There are several scientists devoting time to the puzzle of Bigfoot. However, more research is needed. But the number of scientists studying the phenomenon is not the problem. Research requires funding and to date, no officially funded programs exist. All Bigfoot research is done by amateurs. Secondly, most research is not done to acquire a specimen. Evidence gathering is the predominant mission of most groups devoting time to the quest for Bigfoot, and evidence alone will never satisfy the scientific community. Only a specimen to study will suffice. Given the nature and elusiveness of this primate, a sighting is rare and close observation is almost impossible unless time and effort is devoted to the quest and that time requires funding. It is possible that a specimen may be acquired through some misfortune of the animal itself. If a dead or dying animal could be located, it would be fortunate for us but the odds are against anyone trying to find a specimen in time and in the condition necessary for proper study. Therefore, some individuals and groups have taken the stance that killing an animal is the only way to preserve the species. However, it would require continuous hunting and a chance encounter for a group to be successful. Again, this type of effort requires time and time requires funding. There simply isn't enough manpower funding an organization in place for it to be easy to bring in an animal. Therefore, the swamp ape remains elusive. There are far too many reports of sightings of something in the southern forests, indeed all over America. This something we call Swamp Ape, Skunk Ape, Bigfoot, Oma, Regura, there are several names for it. Whatever it is, it apparently is here. And we, if we can explain where it came from, we may can understand what it is. Of course, if we could get a body, then understanding what it is will tell you where it came from. But since we don't have a body, we're exploring possibilities of where the animal may have come from. The most popular theory, an ape in Asia followed man across the Bering Straits, the land bridge, ended up in America, became Sasquatch, moved across America as far as Florida, 
and its descendant is the skunk ape. The reverse of that is also possible, that apes brought into America, populated the South first, moved out into the West, and became Sasquatch. So let's look at the land bridge idea. When the idea was first postulated, it was that Yeti followed man across the Bering Straits, became Sasquatch. When Gigantopithecus blackie was discovered, actually the only aspect of that that's been discovered is, is a jawbone and some teeth, um, the concept changed, and that's Gigantopithecus blackie that came across the Bering Straits and ended up becoming Sasquatch. It's a fine theory. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a logical theory. There is, however, no evidence to support it. There's no evidence to suggest that Gigantopithecus blackeye went anywhere other than Asia. The only bones that have been discovered were discovered in Asia. Nothing, no fossil trail across the Bering Straits. So, you know, it's a theory. It's a fine theory. But the idea that maybe we brought them here, there may be some evidence to suggest that people, at least, were in America long before Columbus, the Vikings, and so forth. And if there's evidence to suggest that those people had apes, then uh, maybe they brought them here. One of the most fascinating things about this particular theory, for me, was finding a obelisk that dates to the time of the Phoenicians. And in this obelisk, you can clearly see that they had domesticated apes. Now by domesticated apes, I'm saying that there is a depiction of apes with a collar around its neck and a leash like you would have on a dog. Now the ape has its hand up on the back end of an elephant as if it's guiding the elephant, and of course the human is guiding the, uh, the ape. Now this suggests they had domesticated apes. They had them trained, trained to do particular tasks. And if they did have apes that were trained, and these trained apes perhaps were on their ships when they traveled, uh, you know, we know they circumnavigated Africa. We know that they made it out to islands in the Atlantic. So if they made it as far as America with these apes, these apes could be the descendants of what we now call a swamp ape. Another thing to suggest that the Phoenicians may have been in America is the finding of Phoenician writing on tablets that were found in Tennessee as well as Ohio. And also there is an American Stonehenge that could possibly have been built by the Phoenicians. So you've got evidence in America that the Phoenicians or someone from that time period must have been in America somewhere back in antiquity. And if you connect that to the fact that they did have domesticated apes and were very familiar with apes, traveled around Africa, possibly traded apes, then apes could have been brought to America. Another idea would be that if Atlantis did exist, then jumping from Atlantis to America would have been very easy. And it's also possible that Atlantis may have had apes there themselves. Either the Atlanteans brought them from Africa to Atlantis, or they were brought there perhaps even by the Phoenicians. It may have been the Atlanteans that even taught the uh, Phoenicians domesticate, how to domesticate apes. A third possibility, and of course this kind of brings us back to square one, would be that there would be an indigenous species already here. And that indigenous species may have been met by the apes that were brought here. And if so, a fusion took place and what ended up, what we ended up with is what we now call swamp apes. But again, now you're, you're back to square one, having to explain, well, how did the indigenous creature get here, and why is there nothing in the fossil record that suggests that it was here? And of course, just because we have nothing in the fossil record to indicate that uh, Sasquatch has been here forever, doesn't mean that it wasn't. It just means we've not found any fossils. 
but we found fossils of everything else and multiple times so we should have at least found a few so far as far as we know we haven't we do know that apes can live in america and they can thrive according to the primate institutes in louisiana louisiana is the perfect climate to raise primates so if you have uh, a feral population living somewhere here in the south the southern states or somewhere here in america the southern states would be the perfect area for them to be somewhere from oklahoma texas louisiana alabama mississippi georgia florida maybe even in, into south carolina tennessee this area has the climate that primates would want to gravitate to and would want to stay in. And it probably explains why that uh, the ones who, if they were brought here, stayed in this area. There are way too many people seeing things, seeing something in the woods to suggest that they're all crazy or, or it's hallucinations or they're just making it up. And usually when you get one report out of an area, if you begin to ask around that area, you'll find out that other people in the area have also seen something, but they were too afraid to talk about it, or they didn't come forward, they didn't report it. And if you get enough reports out of an area, you've got a hot spot. Be that as it may, apparently we have something here. And again, if we can explain what it is, then we can figure out where it came from. As of now, the one thing that we need more than anything else is additional study and the proper funding for it. The key to the discovery of this animal is awareness. More people becoming involved and more people going into the woods with a critical eye, with the eye to look for evidence. Most people who go into the woods are looking for whatever they're there for. If you go deer hunting, you're looking for deer. If you go turkey hunting, you're looking for turkey. And you could walk right past evidence that suggests there are swamp apes in the woods with you. You're not paying attention. And what we need is more awareness, more people to become aware of unusual sounds in the woods, the, the fleeting glimpse of something that maybe they thought they saw something wasn't sure, pursue it, see what it was. And more people taking the time to report what they've seen. Because it's very important to the study to know where they're seen and to get the reports from an area so that investigators can add that to their list of places to go study. If the species is a displaced ape from distant lands and it no longer has a viable genetic pool to continue to grow from, then we may be seeing the extinction of a new species. Its unfortunate tenure on this continent may be coming to an end. If so, then killing one will make little difference. If Bigfoot is some indigenous species of primate and not a new arrival to our country, its preservation is of no less value. The quest to classify this animal begins with you. Creatures like the swamp ape, Bigfoot, and others must be taken out of the realm of myth and placed on the list of real animals. Awareness is the key. The producers of this program encourage you to do your own research of the Bigfoot phenomenon. There are several organizations with websites on the internet which include more information on Bigfoot. As man grows in population, we have taken the natural habitat of several species in favor of our own. To date, we continue to destroy woodlands and replace them with housing and places of commerce. Even once neglected swamplands deemed unsuitable for human population are being drained and converted to our needs. As we encroach more on the animal's territory, 
we may yet find the last of the creatures of our myth clinging to the only suitable habitat they can survive in. Perhaps then we will know the answer.